Hello and welcome to another NGen Math 7 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we're going to be doing Unit 8 CC Lesson 1 Measuring Chance with Ratios. Unit 8 CC is our last unit in Math 6 and it's on probability. And probability is all about measuring the chance that something happens. And what we're going to see today is that oftentimes that measurement occurs with a ratio, with a fraction. So let's uh Let's jump right into it. Now, we can measure the, some, the chance that something happens by what, are, what is known as using a probability ratio, okay? And again, we're always going to be expressing these, these ratios, at least in this lesson, in terms of fractions. So let's jump right into it and see how we do that with a classic case of marbles in a bag. Let's take a look. Exercise number one, a bag of 12 marbles contains three red marbles, four blue marbles, and five white marbles, all the same size. Nora reaches her hand in and pulls out a marble at random. Letter A, which marble is Nora most likely to pull out and why? All right, well, I'd like you to answer question A. This should be something that should be pretty easy to think about, but why don't you pause the video and see what the answer to A is. All right, well, I'm hoping that you said white, a white marble, right? And it's very simple. There's more white marbles than any other type of marble. That's it. It's that simple, right? So white marble because there are more of them than any other color. All right, simple enough. Let's take a look at letter B. Express as unreduced fractions the ratio of the number of each color marble to the total number of marbles. All right, this is simple enough, right? Right, we just wanna know the ratio of the number of reds to the total number of marbles in our first case. So we've got three red marbles, we've got a total of 12 marbles, so the ratio of red to total marbles is just 3 twelfths. Real simple, right? Why don't you go ahead and do this for blue and white? All right, so what do we have? Well, we have four blue marbles, so that's four twelfths, and we have five white marbles, so five twelfths. Now, if you're thinking to yourself that each one of these is actually the fraction of how many marbles are red, blue, and white, then that is actually fantastic. In other words, three twelfths of the marbles, which is one fourth, but whatever, three twelfths of the marbles are red, four twelfths of the marbles are blue, and five twelfths of the marbles are white, right? Simple enough. How many red marbles are there? Divided by the total number. How many blue marbles are there? Divided by the total. Now, one thing that's key here is that all of these marbles, right, are the same shape, and the idea is, right, that Nora is closing her eyes, she's reaching her hand into the bag, grabbing a marble, and pulling it out at random. All right, in which case we've got these fractions. Now, let's see where we can go with these. Now the chance, or what we call the probability that something happens can be measured using these ratios as long as we have what are known as equally likely outcomes. You're gonna hear that term a lot both in Math 6 probability and every other time you deal with probability in future math classes. Equally likely outcomes. So like in that last problem, right? Every one of the marbles being the same size was as equally likely to be pulled out of the bag as any other marble. Now see, if some of the marbles were like larger or smaller or whatnot, then they may not be equally likely because I might, you know, I might decide, ah, I, I, there's that big marble, I'm going to grab that one, or that small one, I'm going to grab that one. But given that they were all the same size, there's really no way if we're closing our eyes and pulling one out at random, that we can possibly you know, know which one's which. So let's now do some probability ratios. Exercise number two. Keeping with the marbles in the bag above, if Nora pulls out a single marble at random, state the probability that blank. All right, so here's where we're actually gonna be writing down some probabilities. Now the great thing is, 
all the probabilities that we're going to write down here are very similar to what we just did. All right. In fact, the probability that the marble is blue, the way that we literally measure that, is by saying, well, I've got how many blue marbles? Let's actually get this down. We had three red, four blue, five white. So three red, four blue, and five white. So the probability that the marble is blue is simply four twelfths. Now, you could also write that down as one third. That's fine. A probability ratio is a fraction. Oftentimes it can be left in its unreduced form. Sometimes your teachers will want you to reduce it. If it doesn't say you have to reduce it, either one of these answers is great. The probability of marble is white. That's five twelfths. Ratios are so common, so common in probability, that you will even start to hear teachers look at this fraction and instead of calling it 5 twelfths or 5 over 12 or anything like that, you'll actually hear them say things like 5 out of 12, right? So 5 occurrences out of 12 occurrences, the marble will be white. 4 out of 12, the marble will be blue. and 5 out of 12, oh, sorry, 3 out of 12, the marble will be red. Right, that also will reduce down. That would be reducing down to 1 fourth, but again, the unreduced fractions are fine as well. Now, let's continue with this bag of marbles, but let's look at some probabilities where it isn't just what's the probability that's white, blue, red, etc. Letter D. What is the probability that the marble is not red. All right, well again, the probability that is not red, we want to count up all the equally likely outcomes where it's not red. Well, there are three where it's red, and that means that there are nine where it is not red. So the probability that the marble is not red will be nine twelfths. And again, that would reduce, if you want, to three quarters, but nine twelfths is good as well. Well, let's take a look at the probability the marble is not black. Well, we're going to look at all of these marbles. We're going to count up how many of them fall into the category of not black. And that would be, well, actually all of them, right? So the probability that it's not back, black would be 12 twelfths, which you could also just express as the number one, right? It's actually a guarantee that the marble won't be black. And one very similar to letter E, what is the probability that the marble is green? Well, if I look at all of these and I count out how many of them are green, that would be, well, it'd be zero, right? So the probability that the marble is green will be zero twelfths, which you can write down as zero. Now, by the way, those last two are very important, right? We are guaranteed there's a 100% chance that the marble won't be black. So the probability it won't be black is one. We also have a 0% chance, or there's just no chance at all, that the marble will be green. So the probability the marble is green is 0. All right? And those are the two extremes of our probability scale, 0 to 1. And this actually gets into the next question, or the next exercise. Exercise number 3, let's take a look. Looking at your fractions from exercise number 2, how can you quickly tell that none of them are larger than the number one? Right? This is very, very important. Okay? Probabilities cannot be larger than the number one. Now, granted, you might eventually express a probability in terms of percent. Like you might say, well, the probability it's going to snow tomorrow is 25%. But that's actually the number one quarter, right? That's really the ratio one fourth. So that's certainly not greater than one. But in a bigger picture, how can you look at every one of these fractions and know that none of them are bigger than one? Think about that for a moment just in terms of fractions. All right. Well, the only way that a fraction can be larger than one is if its numerator, the number on the top, is bigger than the denominator, the number on the bottom. And in none of these cases is the numerator larger than the denominator. And that kind of makes sense, right? The denominator is literally how many equally likely outcomes do I have, right? And then the numerator is how many of my equally likely outcomes, right? How many of the ones in the denominator 
fall into the category that I'm trying to find the probability of. So there's, there's no way for the numerator to get larger than the denominator. I couldn't have 14 twelfths here. It would be impossible for 14 of the marbles to fit into the category when there's only 12 total marbles, right? The best I could do would be to have something like 12 twelfths, which would be just equal to the number one. So at the end of the day, right, how can you quickly tell none of them are larger than the, the number one? Because none of the numerators, well, I'm going to just write down tops are larger than the denominators. And let me get rid of a little bit of the red there. Numerators. There we go. All right. Very, very important. When we measure probabilities, right, when we measure probabilities, they always go from zero to one. So let's talk about probability and chance. Probability is simply a measurement of the likelihood of something happening. Right? How likely will something happen? And it's important in the real world that we have the ability to measure chance. And you see it all the time. Oh, there's going to be a 25% chance that it's going to rain tomorrow. Or, you know, this basketball player typically makes three out of four th free throws, right? You know, we see probabilities all the time expressed as percents and fractions. And later on in this unit, we will express some probabilities in terms of percent work. Today, it's going to be all about fractions as well as in the next lesson, right? So it can have a value, probabilities that is, from 0 to 1, very oftentimes expressed as a fraction, with a value near 0 indicating a highly unlikely event. So, you know, if, if I said, hey, the probability that I'm going to win the lottery is like, one in 300 million, well, then that's a pretty low chance, right? That fraction, one over 300 million, would be very small and pretty near zero. It's highly unlikely I'm going to win the lottery. And a value near one indicating a highly likely event. So like if there's a, like a nine out of 10 chance, a nine tenths chance that I'm going to cook a meal tonight instead of ordering out, well, then it's highly likely that I'm going to do that, right? It's still possible that I might order food out, but highly likely if it's nine tenths of a chance that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my own food tonight, that I'm going to just make my own food. So let's take a look at this continued emphasis on using these ratios to measure chance. Take a look at exercise number four. In a dozen eggs, three of them are cracked. Zach randomly selects one egg. Answer the following questions. Letter A, what is the probability that Zach will choose a cracked egg? All right, well, why don't you go ahead and do that problem? All right, well, what's our denominator? Well, again, it's 12 because Zach's looking at a dozen eggs, right? How many of those dozen, how many of those equally likely outcomes fall into the category we're looking at, which is cracked egg? Well, three of them. He really got a bum dozen there, right? So the probability that he's got a cracked egg is three twelfths or one fourth, whichever one you want. Now, letter B, simple enough. What is the probability that Zach will choose an egg without a crack? All right, pause the video now and come up with that probability ratio. All right, well, how many equally likely outcomes fall into the category egg without a crack? Well, if three of them are cracked, that means nine of them aren't. So that probability would be nine twelfths, or if you want, three fourths, either one. All right, now finally, letter C. How would you rate the likelihood of Zach selecting a cracked egg? Highly unlikely, somewhat unlikely, neither likely nor unlikely, somewhat likely, or highly likely. Explain. All right, so which one of these, and again, there's really no necessarily right answer on here. Eventually there might be, but right now, just a feel for it. If the probability, 
right? That Zach is going to choose a cracked egg as three twelfths or one fourth, right? Whichever way you want to think about it. Which one of these phrases would you choose to describe how likely it is that he would pick a cracked egg? Well, look at it this way, right? Take a very simple thing. I flip a coin, right? I could get a head or a tail. There's only two things, right? So it must be a probability of one half that I get a tail and a probability of one half that I get a head, right? That would be that sort of like neither likely nor unlikely, right? Now, the probability that he's going to get a cracked egg, well, that's less than a half, right? So it's got to be more unlikely than it is likely that he got a cracked egg. Is it highly unlikely? Well, one out of every four of these eggs has a crack in it, so I wouldn't say it's highly unlikely. You know, I mean, maybe if I had three dozen eggs and, like, one of them was cracked, that would be highly unlikely. But I would call this somewhat unlikely. somewhat unlikely because the probability is less than one half but still not close to zero. If I said to you, tomorrow, right, the probability it's going to rain is 25%. 25% and one quarter are the same measurement, right? So if I said the probability it was going to snow tomorrow was 25%, you know, you probably wouldn't say it's highly unlikely it's going to snow. On the other hand, if I said tomorrow the probability it's going to snow is 5%, then you might say, well, that's highly unlikely. You know, there's a 95% chance that it, that it will snow, right? Um, or that it won't snow, sorry. Whichever one I said. Let's keep going. We'll work more with highly unlikely, likely, all of that in a future lesson. But let's take a look at exercise number five, which illustrates a very important point. A board game has a spinner with eight equally sized regions numbered one through eight as shown. Gabriella spins the pointer once and it lands on a number, not necessarily seven. Letter A, what is the probability that the pointer will land on a multiple of four? All right. Well, why don't you see if you can figure this out? It's a good review, not only of the probability we've just been working on, but also what multiples are. Pause the video and see if you can do this. All right. Well, there are eight equally likely outcomes, and those equally likely outcomes are landing on a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, a seven, and an eight. So an eight is going to be in the denominator. Whatever my answer is, one thing I know for certain is that there's an eight in the denominator. Now I have to figure out how many of those eights fall into, how many of the eight fall into the category of landing on a multiple of four. Well, multiples of four are four times one, four times two, four times three, four times four, etc. So four times one is four, four times two is eight, four times three is 12, but it's not on there, right? So my multiples of four are four and eight, and therefore the probability that it'll land on a multiple of four is two eighths or one fourth. All right. Now, very, very important, let's take a look at letter B. If Gabriella was playing a different game with the spinner shown below, why would the probability of rolling a multiple of four not be as easy to find as in A? All right, so why, why would it be that if Gabriella is now using this instead of this, and I'm not even asking what is the probability that it'll land on a multiple of four, there's going to be no way we can actually figure that out in this problem, but why would it be more difficult to figure it out for this spinner than this one? Pause the video now and see if you can answer this question. Well, it's pretty much this simple. The sections here aren't all the same size. Right? Which means these eight things aren't equally likely outcomes. That's very important. All right? Because numbered sections are not the same size. We do not 
have eight equally likely outcomes. So the only way we can really do this counting thing, where we say, hey, there's eight equally likely outcomes, and two of them fall into the category that we care about, and therefore the probability is one-fourth, the only way we can do that is if getting a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, if they all have the same chance of happening. All right, if they all have the same chance of happening, then it's as simple as saying, well, there's two multiples of four out of a total of eight, so the probability is two-eighths or one-fourth if you reduce it. But down here, these are not equally sized sections. And because of that, they are not equally likely outcomes. So the last question, would it end up being larger or smaller than the value in A? Explain. And let's just be clear about what it refers to. It is referring to the probability of landing on a multiple of four. So would the probability of multiplying on a, <laughs> of landing on a multiple of four be bigger for this spinner or for this one. Pause the video now and see what you think. Well, I'm hoping you said larger. And I'm hoping you said larger because the four and the eight are larger sections here than any of the other numbers. They're more likely. You're actually more likely to land on a four than a two because literally the four is twice the size of the two. And eight Eight is three times the size of these things, right? Actually, landing on an eight is the most likely thing you could have happen here. But regardless, it would be larger because the four and eight are bigger sections than the others. And that's a very important thing, right? We can only do probability ratios when the, all of the outcomes that we're looking at are equally likely. If they're not, then it becomes much more difficult to set up these kind of ratios. Let's wrap this up. Probability is one of the most important fields in math because it allows us to measure how likely something is going to happen when we can't say that something is going to happen for certain. When there's doubt, right? right? And that happens all the time in the real world, right? When we see a batting average for somebody who's playing baseball, that's a probability. When you see something like, oh, their batting average is .357, well, that means 35.7% of the time they're going to be hitting that baseball. Right? At the same time, you know, when we see something like the weather forecast saying tomorrow there's an 80% chance of, of the weather being sunny, well again, that is a probability. And then we use probabilities to make decisions. Right? We use probabilities to make decisions all the time on how, you know, how much we want to risk. Right? Do we want to risk you know, doing something based on uncertainty? Well, if we've got a probability, that can help us make that decision. All right. We're obviously going to be working with probability more in this unit. It's a short unit, but we want to just give you this introduction to probability in Math 6 before you do more of it in Math 7 and Math 8. For now, I just want to thank you for joining me for another NGen Math 6 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.